The scientific attitude toward man is moving continuously from the obvious toward the subtle. We are beginning to recognize a network of intangibles lying behind the human personality. Twenty-five years ago, the world was sharply divided between those who saw in man merely a highly perfected machine and those clinging to the spiritual foundations of our culture and resting their case upon the reality of the human spirit and soul. The interval between these two groups is only now beginning to be bridged. Working largely from the Aristotelian position of man's outer life, thoughtful individuals and learned orders and groups seeking to unfold and advance basic human culture are recognizing the mysterious background which lies behind the obvious conduct of the individual. We are now therefore developing a very common psychological problem, namely wonder about mystery. And whereas not long ago we were certain of everything, now that mystery comes into the picture, we are uncertain of almost everything. In this uncertainty our psychological schools have divided and further divided until we can no longer find any common terminology with, reason with reasonable precision defining their various attitudes. This probing into the source of things makes it convenient also to re-examine ancient forms of knowledge. And whereas 50 years ago, mythology, fable, legend, belonged only to certain art or culture groups, we are now examining it to discover, if we can, other keys to the internal life of the individual. Along the same line, we are beginning to be aware of the workings of ancient sciences. We are still inclined to assume that most of these sciences were psychological, particularly in the fields of therapy. We are still not convinced that all ancient remedies were as effective as they seem to be. And perhaps a great faith, a strong and ardent dedication to beliefs, helped these remedies. And we are thinking now in terms of the importance of this ardent belief in helping us in the various fields of our problems. We have noted that the ancient man seemed to be able to believe more easily than we do because he lived in a world of mysteries and wonders. Modern man has a hard time becoming a devout believer in anything because he lives in a world of so many critical opinions, so many cynical attitudes, and so much that passes for sound and solid knowledge. He is finding, however, that the lack of the ability to believe is weakening him, making him less able to carry the daily burden of life. As he deglamorizes every part of his culture, he, found, he finds himself dying for lack of a little glamour. Now we have a reaction here, but we have now transferred our instinct toward glamour, toward hero worship, toward objects that are not really satisfactory. We are discovering that movie stars, prize fighters and orchestra leaders as subjects for glamour are not quite so efficient or successful as the ancient gods or the muses or the prophets of old. All 
our glamour has become so materialized that it carries with it very little internal contribution to our strength. Digging back into all these old beliefs and ideas, we come to one of the earliest of them all, and that is a word which up to ten years ago was anathema in the field of science, and that word is astrology. It was held to be one of the most ancient of man's vulgar superstitions, held to have no foundation in validity of any kind, and a great many second-rate astronomers have made careers out of belittling it and attacking it. Actually, however, as we have noted before, the subject has never been subjected to actual scientific analysis, even by our so-called scientific method. There is no field of belief in which there has been so much prejudice and so few facts. Taking the attitude, in general, that the concept was in conflict with our daily thinking and with the latest discoveries of science, it has been empirically rejected. Actually, we are not sure that this conflict exists, but we would like rather to assume that it does than to add the slow and laborious procedure of investigating carefully and thoroughly. Again, however, the development of television and the perfection of radio devices, perfection of device, not program, we are sorry to note, has caused us to realize that there are a great many intangible forces operating in our lives. Radio and television, uh, perhaps more than wireless telegraph, which preceded these, has opened to our consciousness the reality of things unseen. We are now willing to accept that this atmosphere in which we live may be a tremendous area of energy transmissions. We are willing to assume that through this room and through our own bodies, waves of energy are constantly moving, invisible to us. But we are not quite sure that their invisibility means that they have no effect upon us. If this effect has to be in terms of body impact, we can deny it. But if behind this body is an energy field, not so different from these very energies moving in space, are we certain that these universal energies have no effect upon our internal energies? Are we able to say with certainty that we are living in a universe of vital force, and yet we are immune to so many aspects and phases of this force? even though the force itself we must accept as the very source of our life. Thinking a little further in this particular field, we are now confronted with radiation and to a degree with fallout. Radiation is much more subtle. We can imagine that fallout consists of minute material substances which can variously poison or contaminate us. But in terms of radiation, we are again in the presence of an invisible energy, and yet we are now convinced that this energy can kill, that it does affect us. And studies of the universal spectrums of various parts of cosmos and space now indicate that radiation is pouring in upon us in many, many ways. Not long ago, a scientist pointed out that we are continuously in a field of radiation that is actually more dangerous than the atomic bomb. This field of radiation coming to us from the sun and from other parts of space would have destroyed us utterly had we not gradually, over millions of years, adapted ourselves to this kind of energy, so that we are living in a field of death, 
living because we have adapted ourselves to death and have come to survive its immediate consequences. With this type of thinking, therefore, the possibility that man lives in a world of energies is not nearly as mysterious as it used to be or as difficult to accept. Nearly always, and this is true of all sciences, we have to break through old superstitions and unfounded interpretations in order to come to the substance of a thing. But let us not imagine for a moment that the stargazers of old were unique in their ability to befuddle their own subject. Today, in practically every branch of learning, the greatest menace is the expert. This individual is so set in his own ideas and so certain of his own methods that for every fact we discover, we add at least three or four new superstitions for our memory to struggle with. Today, we are encrusting nearly all of our modern branches of learning with interpretations and explanations that will be obsolete in ten years. If, therefore, the su subject of astrology has been exposed to human interpretation and misinterpretation, as Dr. Budge of the British Museum points out, for nearly 35,000 years, it is quite conceivable that it would have accumulated a number of elements and factors which may have to be sloughed off in the search for facts. Yet over this same period of time, all of those working with the subject have used the same identical basic machinery. And as is also pointed out by Dr. Budge, the interpretations used today are identical in principle with those found on the cuneiform Chaldean tablets that go very far back into the reign of Hammurabi among the Babylonian peoples. The same essential procedures, the same structures, with the possible exception of mathematics upon which the whole subject depends. There is no other branch of learning that has survived so long without being completely reconstructed. It might therefore seem possible that there was certain validity that is unchanging moving under the surface of the various national systems of divination which we have now come to regard as pseudo-sciences and to consider as hardly worth scientific thought. We are not nearly so sure anymore that these are worth so little attention. Another interesting and significant factor is the wide distribution of these beliefs. It has been said, and perhaps not untruly, that no culture system has ever attained maturity without the belief in the influence of the heavens upon the earth and man. India, China, Persia, Greece, Egypt, practically every great culture that we have known has held this belief. And up to the last 500 years, it has been for the most part held with esteem. And it was certainly regarded most affectionately by the great astronomers of Europe, to whom we are indebted for our new emancipated astronomical theories. I refer to men like Kepler, Galileo, Copernicus, Brahe. These men who were themselves the great patron saints of modern astronomical knowledge. They were all astrologers, including Kepler. This concept means that a thoughtful mind can also accept this idea. Perhaps it was lost to us with the rise of the great 19th century materialistic system. It could not then be fitted in because man could not, under the dictum of science, believe what he could not see or accept what could not be demonstrated in a laboratory. 
Unfortunately, however, he made no consistent effort to demonstrate, and therefore found it easy to reject something that he was not even interested in considering. Again, perhaps, the tremendous competition in the mind of man between, between antiquity and the modern world, the reluctance that we have to assume that other peoples or other ages have had knowledge that was important. We more or less hate to admit this. We like to feel that we are unique in every field of discovery. And one some East Indian scholar and scientist, in this case Nobel Prize winner, tells us that the, that the Hindus were using electricity and making batteries 7,000 years ago. We are more than astonished. We are humiliated. We are offended. It is a personal grievance. And the first thing we must do is to prove that it is not true. It is to us more important to disprove these things than to investigate them. A small opening has been made in this wall of attitude on the level of medicine. Here we observe more and more expeditions going out into the field to study primitive medicine among aboriginal, savage peoples. And from some groups and tribes that are still, or up to recently have been, headhunters, we have made important medical discoveries. We have learned of herbs and simples, of various materials used to combat specific ailments, and out of the primitive lore of the medicine man, the voodoo doctor, and the juju magician, we are gaining information that will help Americans to live longer. At first, this was also so humiliating, no one dared to think about it. Today, however, we have a slightly improved attitude because we are all uncomfortable and are seeking remedies. And it has dawned upon us that it is better to have the remedy than keep the prejudice. It took a long time to get this far. This may be termed a major step in culture, a step towards better times for all of us. The development of psychology has brought with it considerable interest in the intangible sources of human energy supply. It has caused us to become aware of this dream life behind the individual and the classification as we have advanced it of the various forms of phenomena emerging from man or moving through man has increased our respect for the mysterious plus X in the root of man. At one time we were, concert we were certain that this selfhood in man was nothing more or less than the byproduct of irritation in the cerebral processes. That the individual becoming mad enough became a person. We are not quite certain of this anymore either. We are beginning to think more and more in terms of the person living in the body. And we have suddenly come to the realization that an unseen, invisible, immeasurable quantity, which we call self in man, is responsible not only for his actions, but for this vast and wonderful conglomeration of attainments which we call the modern way of life. We are suddenly realizing that the skyscraper that the atomic projectile, the airplane, all of these things emerge from something scientifically beyond access. That from man, as an invisible core, something not to be weighed or analyzed chemically, there is flowing constantly streams of inspiration, intuition, knowledge, thought, reason, and ingenuity which pay off in terms of immense discoveries, tremendous conveniences, and innumerable inconveniences. Whatever this is in man is not an unmixed blessing. It is capable not only of making a tremendous contribution, 
but of gradually transforming man into the problem child of history. With this gradually increasing respect for invisibles, science must ultimately turn its attention to new levels of demonstration. It must discover new sciences of itself or restore them out of the past, by means of which it can approach reasonably, rationally, and so far as is possible scientifically, the mystery of the invisible at the root of all visible things in nature. Until it achieves this, it can never move from the sphere of effects to the world of causes. And all effects are suspended from adequate causes in nature. We like to think, of course, that visible effects are practical and invisible effects, are invisible causes are impractical. Yet how shall we say that that is impractical, which though unseen becomes the power behind all practical works and labors. It is like some mysterious moral force, like man's urge to love. We cannot define it, we cannot explain it, but whatever good we have in our world has come from it. And the failure of this is the most dismal failure that can occur within the structure of human life. So we have these intangibles, and we must approach them scientifically. We must have something more than a grand admiration. We must be able to learn useful ways, useful applications, and also a proper framework upon which to build a common science of human understanding. Going back, therefore, to this rejected field, of what we might almost call astrophysics. We are astonished to find a carefully organized field of symbols, of emblems and figures, of processes and formulas that have come down from the past. It would be astonishing indeed if so many thoughtful persons over so many thousands of years should have been completely addicted to a chimera. It is almost incredible that we could have so scientifically organized imagination. And at the same time, all things have to be tested by their utilities. And it is hard also to imagine that something which had no foundation in fact and was merely a flight of imagination could possibly have sustained itself so long in common admiration. Nor could it have vindicated itself as frequently as it has done by the accuracy of its methods and pronouncements. Thus we are in the presence of something, and in the study of ourselves we discover that these ancient peoples evolved a very comprehensive idea. We do not have to accept it, but I think it is time for us to examine it and try to discover, if possible, whether we are in the presence of a valuable key. Certainly these people taught, these old stargazers taught thousands of years ago that what we call the empty air around us is actually a kind of channel through which energy is continuously moving. They taught us this while, for the most part, we had the dimmest concept of the meaning of energy. They believed, and in practice still apply the belief, that man is in the midst of an immense complex of forces, and that in some mysterious way these forces converge upon his internal life and that from this convergence there are modifications in his nature and temperament, by means of which his outer life is also conditioned. Perhaps one of the simplest ways of trying to understand this is by the recognition of certain common observable phenomena. Most persons are aware of the old family almanac, which was of the greatest meaning and significance to our farmer ancestors. 
The farmer secured his uh, annual almanac with religious devotion and dedication. Back in the beginning of our national life, Benjamin Franklin printed the almanac and George Washington bought it in order to use it in the maintenance of his plantation. Men like Washington and Jefferson and Hamilton would not for a moment have thought that it was possible to maintain a farm without an almanac. Now this almanac contained a, a quantity of astronomically and astrologically calculated information relating to planting, relating to the harvesting, and of course also to the general climatic condition of the year. Some of you probably have known farming people, perhaps were raised on farms yourselves. And it would be quite obvious that a shrewd and canny farmer, and farmers are not foolish, would not have for years depended upon these almanacs for the regulation of his planting and protection against sudden inclemency of weather unless he had justified to himself that it worked. These people were shrewd. They were not even wasting five cents on an almanac unless it meant something. And they certainly would not follow it long if the result was the loss of their crops. But that these things actually did have bearing upon planting has later been proved under scientific conditions in Arizona, where planting various vegetables at different phases of the moon shows distinct effect. That these influences do have some bearing. St. Thomas Aquinas, the great Catholic philosopher of the Middle Ages, pointed out that it would be incredible to assume that the moon, which it has the power to draw the waters of the earth and to establish the tidal rhythm of the seas, that such a powerful influence has no effect on anything except water. Assuming also that it had no effect upon anything except water. Let us remember that the human body is over 85% water. If it can move the tides, this lunar influence, has it any effect upon the liquids and humors of the human body? Studying tree rings, we observe distinctly the cycles of sunspot maxima in the tree. And it is possible to find out from the study of tree rings the dating on cycles of sunspot maxima. Of course, we have easier ways of dating, but it could be done by that means. Is it conceivable, therefore, that a force which will leave a continuous and almost indestructible record of itself within the heavy woody fiber of a tree that this has no effect on anything else. We know also uh, the effect of these motions of energy in space upon the great cycles of financial adversity and promotion in the affairs of men. It has been noted for years that the stock exchange, both the one in England and the one in the United States, the principal stock exchanges. All can be graphed according to planetary and luminary cycles. Now even if we wish to assume that the planets have no effect upon man and only on the stock exchange, can you imagine anyone who is not affected, directly or indirectly? Whenever we come to this recognition, we must come also into the realization of the interdependence of living things. And we must realize that anything or any force which can change the fur on rabbits or can result in the development of these tree ring circles must influence profoundly the interior energies of something. It is difficult to assume 
that all this influence is merely from the outside. We are not able at any moment to check this influence. But after a period of years we perceive it. And we are suddenly aware of a very subtle form of energy modifying the conditions under which we exist. The Greeks held to this concept also. And Plato's great cyclic year and his various periods of alternating fertility and sterility by means of which the cultures of humanity are so profoundly affected. Uh, these observations remain true. The various phenomena which Plato described actually occur. But how shall we understand it? Not having a better explanation, is it conceivable that he could have been right, as he was in so many things? Could a man whose knowledge of politics, government, human philosophy and religion be as profound as it was, and have survived so long to our admiration, been completely naive in something else of equal importance? It is hard to imagine that he could have been. And certainly we have no right to take it for granted we must, therefore, at least make honest investigation. This brings us, perhaps, to one of our important psychological points. Namely, that as we know from the seasons, that the energy availability differs at different parts of the year due to the inclination of the Earth's axis we know that this is true because we can watch the coming of winter and we can watch its disappearance again after the vernal equinox. We see the larger part of the earth affected by this. We measure it in terms of human adjustment and non-adjustment. And today, parts of our eastern seaboard are blanketed in snow. We are not so blanketed here. Other parts of the world are now preparing for the glories of summer, such as our neighbors in Australia. These differences we know are due to astronomical phenomena. And we know that these differences affect the birth rate. We know they affect the death rate. And we recognize that untimely situations arising in the world's climate affect us in economically in the destruction of crops, affect us in the terms of health. Any physician will point out to you the seasonal epidemics. Also, we know the vulnerability of the sick, and we recognize that millions of people today are leaving extreme climates and gathering in our own delightful Southern California smog-infested atmosphere <laughs> because they are tired of facing pneumonia every winter. This situation is obviously the result of a chemistry of universal factors. If the sun were not where it is, if the planets were not where they are, and if the earth was not in its present position among them, this entire group of circumstances would be totally changed and man himself could do nothing about it. For in the presence of these elements, man as a person is hopeless and helpless. That these things, therefore, pound upon his outer life, we know. So we are presented at this time with two possible psychological schools of thought. One is that the effect of universal energy modifications upon man are due first to the effect upon his environment. There is no doubt that religions are the results of longitude and latitude. If the Finns had not lived where they lived, they would not have given us that beautiful classical religious mythological poem, the Kalevala. If the Hindus had not been exactly where they were, 
they would not have given us the peculiar interpretation of Hinduism that we have today. If the Japanese had lived somewhere else, or under different conditions, they would not have had the peculiar flowery arts with which we associate them. Thus the distribution of climates may definitely and does certainly affect body structure, social adjustment, degree of activity. It has a strong effect upon ambitions, motivations, and upon the contemplative interior life of the person. Thus if man is the result of the town in which he lives, the books he reads, the friends he meets, and the relatives he has accumulated, so he is also subject to the seasons, the weather, the climate, the uh, terrain in which he exists. Mountain people are different from valley people. And it is quite conceivable that this vast intangible atmosphere, which is actually constantly modifying our way of life, may also be moving in upon us as a psychological factor in our temperament and our disposition. Thus merely the fact that the sun and the moon and the stars are in the sky has affected us. It has affected our religions and in turn these have moved our living. The contemplation of the sunset affects man. Whether we wish to say it is the sunset itself or the contemplation of it may be a psychological point, but it has had its effect and has come down to us in the personification of the sunset in a whole cycle of gods and goddesses and heroes. These in turn have affected our moral lives. And to a measure, our moral lives are in continuous and stressful relationship with economic existence. These things affect. Consequently, if we wish to say that the universe produced the environment by which man is what he is, we are only making another statement of the power of universals upon the life of individuals. Now we know that man's actual existence, along with the existence of everything else that does exist, is due to participation in a life principle that through man constantly something electric, magnetic, some strange life fluid essence pours and flows continuously. That in this essence also man has his existence in the light and the air and space around him. For every part of himself that is tied to the earth. There are countless parts tied to space. We have become so accustomed to watch our feet and think of the solid earth beneath as a symbol of all reality that we have forgotten that were we and are we separated from the space energy by which life is maintained. We will simply and do simply pitch forward upon the earth dead. Thus our lives come to us out of life itself. And how shall we observe or assume that life reaches us? Are we to follow with the ancients that believe that the life of man really originates in the living spiritual being that ensouls the planet? Or are we willing or more inclined to assume that it arises from the tremendous energy fields in which this planet floats, suspended itself by one of the greatest mysteries of energy and motion? Thus assuming, and we must assume, we have no choice, that our energies by which we can lift a hand, read a book, take a step, that these energies are invisible, but absolutely real. And that without these energies, we have no achievement, no existence possible. We have the telephone. We have the instrument on the wall or on our desk. 
We know that it is tied with a mass of wires and a network of stations and substations to phones all over the world. Yet if the current that moves within these wires and carries the message ceases, the telephone ceases to be important, although its physical structure remains undisturbed, it ceases to live. It is dead. Therefore, the energy which we cannot see is really a kind of divine power, and the instrument made for that energy is our acceptance of the reality of that power and our desire to build a house for it, whereby it can live with us and serve us. But the instrument is the servant of the energy. Without the energy, the instrument is meaningless. And in the same way, the human body, about which we boast so much and so continuously, is an instrument. And without the energy that ensouls it, it is meaningless. It is unable to achieve any of the purposes for which it is intended. Now, we have not yet reached a point in popular thinking where it has occurred to us that this energy upon which we live may come to us in a conditioned form. We are fully aware that there are many energies in space, that there are planetary rays, solar rays, cosmic rays. We are now recognizing that we have a universe like a very intricately woven fabric the very substances of this fabric being composed of energy. That this energy is subject to innumerable laws of its own kind. And that there is also various adjustments and conflicts between the laws of energy and the laws of matter. These facts are dimly coming to our attention. But now comes the gravest question that we know. This energy stream that sustains us is it a pure, unconditioned stream? Is there nothing between this life principle and body? If there is anything between, what is it? Is there some reason, some archetypal pattern governing the distribution of this energy according to laws, according to principles, according to values? If such government exists, in what is it positive? What is the universal machinery by means of which the specializations, diversifications of energy are possible? We know that the orderly progression of seasons means that this energy is subject to mutation. It is subject to being more or less available. We cannot say that the energy itself is more or less. But we do know that in a given area, at a given time, the energy allotment may be reasonably determined. That this allotment is not continuously identical with itself. That in some areas the allotment is greater than in others and that this allotment is governed by laws of periodicity. Consequently, we have evidence, physical evidence, to prove that the flowing of this energy into form is subject to laws. That it is not just simply a great sea in which we all swim, but that it is a kind of ocean in which there are innumerable currents and therefore, that because of the infinite diversity of the sea itself, in this case, it is able to sustain an infinite diversity of life. Studying this, the only answer that anyone has ever been able to advance, and Kepler probably did as well with it as anyone has, the only explanation to account for the control, regulation, systematic, distribution of energy is the relationship between universal bodies. That just as surely as the comparatively insignificant inclination of the Earth's axis results in the vast phenomenon of seasons, that actually energy is specialized by relationship. And that it is not that the individual is nearer to it or further from it, but assumes various aspects in relation to it. 
that constitutes these modifications. That the continual motion of the heavens with its innumerable universes and galaxies extending into the uttermost conceivable and inconceivable fastnesses of duration. That this immense machine actually is responsible for continuous modification in the flow, volume, relationship of energies. Some of these energies moving from remote areas are of such long duration that they are like Plato's platonic year, which lasts over 25,000 human years. Others of these relationships are so immediate that they are changing every few seconds. There are tremendous interrelationships of long and short time cycles, some extending into such infinities that we can scarcely calculate them. But every one of these cycles is supporting some organized movement in creation. And when these cycles end, these movements end. When these cycles are exhilarated or reach critical areas, critical situations arise, not only affecting man, but affecting the whole solar system and the universe. Thus we live within this tremendous field of energy which is being continuously modified. This modification undoubtedly is responsible for the gradual changes in human psychology. It makes available or less available mental energy, emotional energy. It results in world fatigues and the dying out of races and species. It also results in immediate and momentary fatigues, tensions, stresses, and the various problems with which we are familiar. If, therefore, we are seeking a formula, perhaps one of the simplest understanding formulas that we can have is that man, as a moral, mental, and emotional creature, is constantly interpreting the available conditioned energy upon which he exists. If this energy supply is lessened before it reaches him, we have one kind of phenomenon. If man, through his own development, structural, or psychological becomes resistant or inconsistent with energy which has reached him, therefore does not permit it to move through him in its proper causes and channels, we have another kind of modification. So man is suspended between a moving universe and all motion results in qualitative modification. Everything that moves changes. And because the universe is infinite motion, infinitely extended, so every moment of the universe is different. Man living within this constant difference experiences one of the first dilemmas, namely that he cannot understand such motion. Therefore, through his ignorance and failure to respond, he does not keep pace with the motion of energy. As the interval between his own motion and that of energy increases, he comes into conflict with the very life principles upon which he depends for existence. Such conflict may well lie beneath the entire problem of human adjustment, physical and metaphysical. Assuming, then, the possibility and the reasonable probability that man is an interpreter of universal energy, that he is a kind of small universe in which all these parts of the greater world have their miniature reflections and models, we then come to the conception that man's existence lies largely upon the foundation of his available energy. Energy is the source of function, and function for man is the reason for existence. Unless he is able to function in these patterns, he has lost 
the significance of these patterns to himself. If then we must seek for a basic explanation, let us remember that the very primary elements of ancient astrological thinking had to do with energy allotments. We divide people today into two basic types. Those who are truly active and those who are tired. And today the majority of human beings is tired. This tremendous sense of fatigue which we all commonly experience and which makes life increasingly difficult for us. The ancients recognized this and declared that it was due to certain negative cycles or cycles of negativity moving in the great tidal system of space. That is the tides of the sea ebb and flow. So the tides of energy in man ebb and flow. Now ebbing and flowing psychologically is a very important thing inasmuch as we have to recognize that energy is never actually absent. It is merely not available in its accustomed form and demands a new or different kind of adjustment. This adjustment we have in psychological thinking in two types of persons called the extrovert and the introvert. The extrovert is the individual who seemingly possesses more abundant immediate energies. The introvert is the individual in whose life these objective energies are not as obvious or abundant. Nature is only telling us, however, that in the character of man, as in the universe or in the growth of the oak tree, there are alternations of objectivity and subjectivity required in nature. In an effort to standardize living, we have totally ignored this. We have assumed that every individual at all times must be upon an equal energy footing. It is possible that he is upon an equal footing, but he is not able to exhibit or manifest identical equal energy at all times. We know that sleep is intended to help us to catch up on some of our energy problems but it does not go as far as our providing needs at the moment. Sleep may take care of part of our physical and psychological life, but there is something else that has to be considered, namely that nature has set this grand pattern that is caused to operate by an innumerable galaxy of suns, and that man, regardless of his egoism, is still merely a tiny creature within this incredible machinery. Man's happy adjustment depends upon his gradual understanding of the kind of world he lives in and his willingness to live according to what he understands when he does learn. This combination is essential to his life. Introversion and extroversion are natural motions. They are the result of the fact that nature recognizes that man has two needs. He has need for an external life and he has need for an internal life. Experience shows that on balance, the overdevelopment of his external life has impoverished his internal life. By his failure to enrich it, with the conscious contributions of his own mental and emotional energies. As a result of his own failure, man therefore has come to the point where extroversion or self-expression outwardly becomes comparatively easy for him and he is inclined to overdo it. Whereas introversion or the return of the individual inward the turning of his tides towards his internal life has resulted in him coming face to face with a situation so deplorable that under generally general conditions, introversion has become practically synonymous with neurosis. 
Thus, instead of living a balanced life of internal and external polarizations, the individual is so depleted, impoverished, or neglected inwardly that he is like too many persons in our nation who drive a fine car and give all the sense of prosperity, but whose homes are neglected and chaotic. The individual, turning into himself, finds a condition which leads to suffering rather than adjustment. This is nature pointing out a defect, for man should be able to move inwardly and outwardly without tension or stress, finding an excellent, important, and useful life in both of these polarizations. If his energies were available to him, such would be possible. Now, other factors also contribute to man's life, and there can be no doubt whatever that time and place do influence the, ent the entrance of the human being into material life. The time and condition in which a person is born is valuable. The important thing has been ignored psychologically, although it is accepted historically. Can we deny that an individual born at the beginning of the Napoleonic Wars was under a different type of environmental heritage than the person that was born, we will say, in the Golden Age of Greece? Now, both may have had their wars and their troubles, but it is not possible to say that the time and place of birth are meaningless. The time the individual is born and the place where he is born, these circumstances bring him into a particular relationship with the patterns of history and also with the, re with the relations and customs and attitudes of tribes and nations, racial groups and social structures. Man being born today is born into a social pattern that did not exist a hundred years ago. We know that in living, the average person cannot psychologically outlive his generation. If he is forced into conflict with his own upbringing and the years of experience through which he has passed, he becomes discouraged and confused. Psychology makes a great deal of heredity. Astrology simply states that man's universal heredity is derived from his relationship to universal energy fields. Also, that the peculiar circumstance of his birth is a relationship between energy in the field of space and the energy of the individual himself. Therefore, there is a time to be born and a time to die. And these things are within chemical fields of relationships, which are exact and inevitable in nature. By means of such laws and principles, not only is universal machinery maintained, but also universal ethics, the rightness of things, is made possible because of the immutability of the universal pattern in which we exist. Also in studying their nativities of persons in ancient times, the old stargazers studied, first of all, the individual's personality. The personality is that part of us which we exhibit to others. This personality is the container, the vessel, into which energies will be poured. It also reveals the immediate use that we shall make of the energy available to us, a use which will be in some way unique or different from the use made by another person. Consequently, personality becomes the final distributor of man's personal energy. It tells us about his enthusiasms, his interests, and his attitudes. It gives us something of the degree of specialization in which his life will be patterned. 
then this is compared with another very great factor, and that is his energy allotment. And basically, this allotment was anciently based upon the position of the sun in the relationship of the great year. Thus, as truly, we have distribution of available energy in the seasons. Persons born in these seasons have certain energy peculiarities. And not long ago, there was a published list of accidents on the Bay Bridges in San Francisco. And it was pointed out that the accident rate is entirely erratic and breaks all laws of accidental probabilities. Instead of these accidents occurring according to a patternless uh, sequence, these accidents are highly patterned. And by the study of them, it becomes immediately obvious that the accident is not an accident, that it is based upon certain energy problems, that the individual at the wheel is much more likely to go to sleep and have an accident, or is much more likely to have slow reflexes and have an accident. All these things are determined apparently by energy allotments. Thus the sun to the ancient was the symbol of man's energy allotment, its relationship to him, its effect upon him, and the bridge between the sun in the heaven and the source of life light in man. This bridge was always regarded as the nativity, the symbol, the horoscope the sign by means of which certain actual calculations of the availability of energy resources could be made. Now, better calculations may be made in the future, but we view with considerable interest the audacity of the ancient, who long before the dawn of science actually did fashion the bridge, by means of which he sought to measure the life power in man and the peculiar action of this life power in various men, not merely and in, in an empiric situation. From energy allotment, then, we come to the conclusion that two kinds of persons do exist. Those who by nature are essentially positive, and those by nature essentially negative. Now, by negative and positive, we do not mean good and bad, nor do we mean strong and weak, nor do we mean helpful and helpless. These are not the applications, because as the Chinese and East Indians pointed out long ago, the greatest mystery of all is the mystery of negative energy, not positive energy. Now, up to the present moment, we have considered negative energy, merely that part of energy which we do not understand. Negative energy may also be that part to which we do not immediately respond. It may also be that part of energy not yet explored. And if that is what is meant, then indeed the negative energy is the greater part, because we know hardly a fraction of what must ultimately be known about these subjects. But negative energy is in some way what we might term a spiritual energy. It is negative as we now view all spiritual things, because they are not immediately visible to us. It is negative because it does not help us to get rich. That is, not obviously. And anything that does not help pay bills is not only negative, it is a luxury in these times. It is termed negative also because it forces man into one of the most disagreeable relationships he can endure, and that is, into his own company. Negative energy is energy which has by its tendency a motion inward or away from objectivity. Negative energy, therefore, to us may be little more than a vacuum. But it is this vacuum that it conceals the mystery of deity. 
all things moving upon the levels of positive energy are very obvious in their functions. The individual gets up, rolls up his sleeves and does things. But what does he do? What is the final result of what he does? Usually his own destruction. By positive energy, he is le he's led from one excess of action to another. Also, of course, he is led to a certain degree of material accomplishment. It is not that we should discount so-called objective energy. It is that we should recognize that like nearly everything else that makes up our modern pattern, it is of secondary importance elevated to first place that this so-called positive energy is leading us into a quantitative victory over the unknown. Whereas what is termed negative energy is the secret of our qualitative victory. And of this we have very little knowledge or thought at the present time. Nearly all solutions to all problems arise from the individual who is able to become adjusted receptively to truth. Receptive adjustment, therefore, makes use of a kind of energy which is different from that which is used in material objective adjustment. Actually, receptivity appears to use less energy. Actually, it uses more of a very refined kind of energy. Because receptivity is not negativity as we know it. What we call negative energy is simply an energy with a purpose which does not lie within the field of our ordinary experience. Yet upon this energy, we must build and we live because of it. Because our internal life is sustained by this energy in the same way that our external life is sustained by material energy. Out of therefore, uh, therefore, out of the study of the effects of the universe upon man, we must ultimately come to the recognition that man has an internal life, which we may term a psychological life and that this is subjected to laws other than the laws of matter. Our attitude today is that all influence that models or molds the internal life of man comes from the outside and is made aware, and we are made aware of it, or it is visible to us because of the light of the sun shining upon it. Paracelsus declared emphatically that the interior life of man is also subject to energies and laws which are not obvious materially, and that the individual's inner life is subject to its own environment, the forces of it, and the energy sustaining it. If our outside life is in a quantitative environment, our inner life is in a qualitative environment. Consequently, our inner life has an existence of its own. And this existence also has a nativity, has an endurance in space, and is subject to a kind of energy pattern. What we call psychologically archetypes are more or less proofs of this. For archetypes are forms set up in a formless state. They are kinds of entities which are not materially available to us, yet they become the actual motivating symbolic energy powers by which conduct can be and is modified. Thus in astrology the ancients were firmly convinced that man possessed an internal being and that this internal being was subject to laws that must be discovered, and that these laws are not just the laws of material existence, but are laws relating to the control direction of electrical and magnetic phenomena. That the spiritual life of man 
operates in a field of energy, just exactly as the material life of man uh, operates in a field of phenomena. That we must understand this energy and must most of all adjust to it. The inner life of man has a normal or an abnormal adjustment with its own energy fields. When the inner life of man is completely the result of the pressure from the lower outer life of man, then this inner life is imprisoned, locked within a situation for which it was not intended. There was never a time in nature when nature intended the lesser to govern the greater. There was never a time in the constitution of man when it was assumed that the outer life of man could satisfactorily regulate his inner life. In every instance, the inner life must regulate the outer. Authority must be vested in that which is superior. When, therefore, the outer life of man, <coughs> affecting the internal life, makes it difficult or impossible for the psychic field to operate normally in manifestation in this world, we have a psychotic. We have a false situation whenever we try to force that which is less upon that which is intrinsically more. Also in this situation, we have the continual fact of the need for the psychic life of man to keep the laws of the psychic life of the universe. Man who breaks the material laws of nature is punished physically. When man's entity or selfhood comes out of adjustment with universal energy, he is punished inwardly or metaphysically. He is punished by a series of invisible ailments that are as dangerous to him as physical ailments are to the body. Paracelsus pointed out that every ailment known to the body has its equivalent in the psychic field of man, and that it is just as easy for the individual to be sick psychically as it is physically. But he did not affirm, and neither did the other ancients, that all psychic sickness arises from the personality. He assumed that psychic sickness arises from psychic disobedience in the same way that physical sickness results from physical disobedience. And psychic disobedience is in harmony between the energy field of man and the great universal field which must nourish it. In harmony of this kind, man does arise from several possible causes. The most common cause would be paralleling that of physical ailments. Namely, that the individual's psychic field is unable to form a natural, proper adjustment with its own source of nutrition. That wherever this occurs, you have psychic stress. And wherever this occurs, you have something else that causes it. And the thing that causes it would be the equivalent of egoism or egotism. The individual who stands against the law, the individual who believes or thinks that he does not have to obey, the individual who takes an attitude of aggressive egoism in forcing his own concepts upon nature. His punishment for his arrogance is exactly what occurred to the builders of the Tower of Babel. As most ancient physicians and some schools of modern medicine point out, the greatest single cause of sickness is obstruction, that by means of which natural function is impaired. Bodily obstruction due to tension will impair body function and reduce health. Psychic tension in the form of psychic stress interferes with the distribution of energy on the psychic plane and makes possible the development of psychic ailments. If then the problem of the great cyclic year is taken into consideration, man must not only keep the laws of nature to exist, 
but he must also keep the laws of soul if he is going to exist. The laws of nature. These are simply man's way of naming energies. Laws are actually at least manifested through great orderly energy patterns. Wherever there is disobedience, it means that we have broken relationship with energy. Wherever we have gone our own way, regardless of right and wrong, we have broken harmonious relations with energies that were necessary to sustain us. And the ill result of our poor conduct is due to the amount of energy that is cut off. In the same manner, our psychic life is due to the energies which by various attitudes, complexes, fixations, etc., by which we crystallize or obstruct the motion of the psychic life of man. It is as though a fish in the sea tried to stand firm and prevent the tides, especially a very small fish, a minnow. <laughs> this particular type of disobedience is ridiculous and is only possible because man does not understand. If he ever saw the facts, he would not be so foolish. Actually, however, adjustment with nature carries much more of an implication than we generally assume. Let us imagine that man psychically formed an adjustment with the great energy fields by which he lives. His adjustment must be almost a Buddhistic one. And perhaps this is one of the reasons why Buddhism will someday be of the greatest value in psychology. Man adjusting to universal energies, psychically particularly, where you have a much more volatile world of value, he is adjusting to motion. He is not adjusting to something that is fixed. He is not adjusting to a point where he has once adjusted, it will always be so. He is adjusting to something that is never twice the same. He is adjusting to something that is itself pure motion. Consequently, his adjustment cannot be a mental one, because the mind's thoughts cannot move that rapidly. It cannot be an emotional one, because his emotional climate cannot change so quickly. His adjustment must be one, then, of total acceptance of motion. Or everything which impedes motion, or impairs it, must cease in his own psychic field. And unless it does, he will continuously be subject to pressure. Now, such an adjustment is not negation. It is the most difficult of all possible attainments, because it means that the individual must be integrated in constant motion. He cannot merely lie back and float. He must function in motion. He must recognize that out of a moving core within himself, continually adjusting more completely to the energy patterns of space, he is unfolding, he is growing, he is moving with qualitative as well as quantitative motion. To achieve this is a, a very high end in learning and knowledge. And before he can achieve it, he must recognize the need of it. He must recognize, therefore, that the universe is constantly impelling him to subjective adjustment, is penalizing him for having a certain crystallization within his psychic life, by means of which his physical life is damaged and the unfoldment of his internal life is frustrated. To move with these energies, to be able to use them, requires a greater knowledge of them and their attributes, their qualities, and their keywords, and the ancient fashioned a simple little 
design on a piece of paper, which he called a horoscope, and in which he set forth in an elementary and rudimentary manner, it is true, the pattern of man's most immediate adjustment situation. He was convinced in his old days that this pattern was valid, that it was the only form of learning known to man in which his personal relationship with the universe was revealed. That it was no longer a grand relationship, but a, an intimate one in which the universe moving into man and through man, and man moving into the universe and through the universe, that these twofold procedures could be uh, analyzed, classified, studied, and with sufficient pains and effort, the entire subject could be broken open and made available to the individual. On this line of thinking, then, I believe there is more work to be done, more work that should be done as soon as possible, in order that we can finally get at the subjective person, not merely as he is reflected through body, but as he exists in his own nature, and will begin to emphasize the importance of working directly upon this subjective being by the great disciplines of philosophy and religion, rather than to depend entirely upon reflex action from the external life. We are working in a clumsy manner. We are trying. We are much further than we were 50 years ago. But we still have a long way to go. And it would be nice to feel that everyone essentially interested will do all they can to encourage this research and not fall into the ancient pattern of pronouncing these things impossible or improbable. We live in a world where nothing is impossible. And the great thing that must be made possible is human adjustment. And until that is achieved, there will be no solution to the common disasters under which we must mutually suffer. It is our own final adjustment with this great clock of space, with its countless intermingling values, that gives us our hope of ultimate security and peace. Time's up. Now, not long ago, we had a number of folks came together and were talking about something. And someone said, yes, reincarnation is a very interesting theory. Karma is fascinating. But what would it do to our Western way of life? Supposing everyone started believing it here, living according to it, would it mean that we would have economic failures? Would it mean bankruptcy? Would the bottom drop out of the stock exchange? What would happen to our religions, our philosophies, and our sciences? If we lived and believed according to this doctrine, would we go forward a thousand years or backward a thousand years? It's an interesting theory and problem, so we're going to discuss it next week. We hope you'll all be here to uh, share in this occasion. We have a little pamphlet called Planetary Influences and the Human Soul, which may be of interest in connection with the subject of this morning. We also have a book dealing with the primitive concepts of the principles underlying uh, the study of astrology from a philosophic rather than a genolithiacal level. The subject is the philosophy of astrology. Don't forget our newest book, Collected Writings, which might make a nice Christmas present if you know friends who like our books and do not have this one. Our Lady of Dreams book has been used by hundreds and thousands of people for Christmas gifts. So we call this one to your attention as something that might help you, where something a little better than a card is required. Our used book table has a number of gems on it, which we think you will enjoy browsing through, and we certainly thank you for being with us this week and hope to see you next week.